my friends, the great experiment. The crew doesn't hate the XO, then he's not doing his job. Good hunting is what you say. It's part of the pattern, part of the plan. Are they the lucky ones? That's what you're thinking, isn't it? Welcome to Greatest Trek and Hot Cylon Summer. It's a Star Trek podcast about Battlestar Galactica today. <laughs> that we're doing uh, in between new Star Trek series over on our Greatest Trek show. I'm Adam Pranica. I'm Ben Harris, and I love the just internal contradiction of that. Yeah, you should check this out. It's a Star Trek podcast about Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> what else are we going to do? I don't know. The thing people actually want us to do. Oh, this is it. I think this is it. I think this is it. Yeah. I don't know if our friend Aaron Waltke will ever forgive us, but fuck it, man. Well, Aaron Waltke can fucking wait. <laughs> he can get in line. We started a thing that we're going to finish, and then uh, and then he's up next. Yeah, he's, he's uh, battered on deck. He knows his place in our hearts, and that's second place after Battlestar Galactica. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Been so much drama behind the scenes. Oh god! You and I, you and I have barely talked because the talking has been difficult for you, given yes. a a recent oral surgery situation. I'm I'm asking for me, and I'm asking mm. for the FODs out there. How's that hot mouth, man? The hot mouth is. Uh... Is it hot mouth summer? Hot mouth summer. I'm feeling a lot better today. Yeah. I am, at your urging, taking just a spectacular volume of steroids every day. Yeah. And that seems to be helping. So far, I haven't raged out at anyone. That's not really what they do in this context. That's, no? That's the joke. But man, a handful of steroids in your specific condition, I mean, that's what you need. You need to, yeah. to give your body the strength. To get through what sounds like is a pretty significant trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I had a bad uh, experience almost a week ago as of this recording. I have congenitally too few teeth in my mouth. I, I have no wisdom teeth, but I'm also missing a molar on one side. Like just way fewer teeth than most people are born with in my head. That makes you very attractive to a, a certain type of lover, I bet. I imagine so. I mean, the 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 gap in my front teeth is is one bit of evidence for this. Mm -hmm. The the like the molars at the back of your mouth. I don't know if you know this. Push all your teeth forward. They're like the you know what, what do you call those things you put on two sides of books to make them look nice. You we're talking about bookends. Bookends. Yeah, they're the bookends of the mouth. How about that? I didn't know. Yeah, and so uh, missing this one molar has caused all of my all of my teeth to drift around a little bit mm -hmm. and. It's also caused the opposing molar that would be biting down to just, it just keeps growing. It's a stalactite that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And uh, like the Lisa Simpson graphic that her orthodontist showed her uh, when exactly. she asked what yeah. she'd look like without braces. Mm -hmm. Here's Lisa today. Without treatment, here's what she'll look like at age 11, age 14, age 17, and finally, age 18. Every dentist I've ever been to has, has told me, like, you know, at some point you're going to need to get an implant so that this tooth doesn't fall out. And they've been telling me this my whole life and uh, finally bit the bullet. And I had, I mean, it was because my dentist was like, listen, man, like, I know you've been hearing this your whole life and you're like, yeah, 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 I'll get to it. It's like now is when you get to it. Like you have to do it because this tooth is going to fucking fall out soon if you don't do it. Did it feel that way to you? Or did you just get used to the weird feeling that it always presented? It is like noticeably lower in my mouth than the other teeth. Huh. So set up with an orthodontist, found out about the comically expensive procedure that I would be undergoing. Uh, trigger warning. <laughs> Horrific dental surgery details incoming. They drill out your jaw. They put a, I guess, a piece of metal or something in there. And then they let that heal for a few to several months, and then they put a fake tooth onto that post. Mm -hmm. So I was going in for the post, and originally a month ago I went in for the post, and they 
numbed me up and I was sitting in the chair and they came back into the room and they're like, hey, bad news, autoclave is broken. None of the instruments we would be using for today's procedure can be sanitized, therefore can't do it, go home. And I went home (laughs) with a numb mouth and nothing to show for it. And then went back a month later to actually get it done. To the same orthodontist. Same orthodontist. Okay. And this time I was like, hey, so like when I left, like I felt like my mouth had been maybe like less numb than it might have needed to be for what we were doing. And she was like, good to know. I'm going to, I'm going to hit you three times instead of just the one that you got before. Like I'm going to go completely over the top with, with the numbing injections so that we are sure. Was one of the ankles hitting it from the back? Oh, yeah, yeah. She she had me throw my jaw in a circle. <laughs> they got going with the drilling and the, you know, you're going to feel shaking and pressure, but it shouldn't hurt. And eventually I was like, hey, so this hurts kind of a ton. And at that point they x-rayed me and they were like, hmm. And I think they gave it like one more go. And I was like, no, it's, it's seriously like insanely painful. Just a, a point of context here, they x-rayed you after the procedure started? Yeah, I mean, they they had x-rayed me for this on the consult, uh-huh. uh, you know, earlier on. Uh-huh. But um, they x-rayed me and were like, hey, so like what's, what's happening is your nerve is supposed to be going through this one little channel and it spread out or, or shifted over or something over time in your jaw and it is much too close to where we need to drill for the post. And what you're feeling is us getting like danger close. So they presented me with two options. One of them's like a pipe wrench, and the other one's a belt. <laughs> <laughs> you you can continue forward, and we'll like you know try to hit you with some more numbing, and and just see if you can manage and and get this post in. But there's like a fifty fifty chance it will be too close to the nerve, and it will just be like a source of great discomfort, and you will have to have it removed. Or we can abort the procedure. And I was like... <laughs> oh, wait. So so there's a chance they could put in the post and it's just like not great for the nerve situation and then they'd have to go back and remove it? Right. Yeah. I mean, there Oof. could have been... There, there's a chance that it, it would be fine though. Yeah. But I was like, I don't... I can't proceed with how this is feeling. So we stopped and I got up to go, you know, schedule my follow-up appointment or whatever. And I like kind of like collapsed in the in the lobby and nearly lost consciousness. It was no fun. I um I had to beg them not to bring the ambulance, which my wife scolded me for later, but um I I really didn't want the ambulance and it just felt like that was not what I wanted at that time. Was this in any way related to the pass out you had on that international flight? Like is this a thing that you do? It is, yeah. That is called a vasovagal syncope. And I think probably that was what was happening, but I didn't quite go under this time. Uh, But so they like wouldn't let me leave. And they like, I mean, you know, that was smart of them. Like I shouldn't have left, but they like bought me a smoothie. They had a smoothie delivered. (laughs) And I sat in one of the dentist chairs and just like did the crossword puzzle for an hour. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a day, and then you know went home, and I've just been in like agonizing pain for the last few days, despite taking the like horse pill size ibuprofens and Tylenols, and being really ginger with myself. So, so the plan from here is what to go back for a third time to complete whatever this is, or what? No, it's incompletable. They they have told me like uh, like make your peace with your tooth it's gonna fall out huh yeah there were i mean there, there were other reasons why this was getting more complicated which i won't go into just for nobody needs to get all the details reasons have you seen many dentists for this have you gotten a second opinion oh yeah i've seen orthodontists on both coasts adam mm. i mean like this was something that like i toyed with doing in my 20s and my 30s and now that i'm 40 it was like it's go time as your friend and someone who who thinks protective thoughts of you, <laughs> I can't help but dislike a uh, smoothie dentist for you yeah. in this moment. It's going to be hard for me to trust that person. 
Yeah. With your care. I'm worried that I've become guy that needs to be put under general anesthetic to go to the dentist now because it was it was really genuinely upsetting. I mean, you're definitely get a ride home from any of these procedures, guy. You know? Yeah. That sucks. Yeah, from now on, for sure. Can't be my own chauffeur. Well, it feels awful to know that my friend has gone through such pain over the course of as many days, but I do want to tell you, I'm here to inflict more pain on you. I told you this over text before we began, like, are you sure you can record today? And you're like, yeah, no problem. And I'm like, I'm going to make you fucking bleed out of your packing. I'm going to make you laugh. That's my goal. So that's the goal today when we talk about this episode of Battlestar Galactica. Can I make my co-host bleed laugh? Can uh, can the friends of DeSoto hear the sutures tearing? Like, will the laugh drown that out or not? One of my favorite uh, scores to keep is like when if you can make someone laugh enough to like spit their drink out or something. Uh-huh. This is next level for me. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go hunting today. <laughs> <laughs> FOTs. <laughs> As we talk about Battlestar Galactica season one, episode three, Bastille Day. If we're not free, then we're no different than Cylons. The fleet has pulled into orbit around this planet where they're going to get the water. And uh, Tig is having something to drink, but that ain't water. Yeah, you got to hit the breakfast bottle. When you're tag, and uh, two shots for a growing boy. Like if I had to guess how much of his his vanishing reserve of booze he would be enjoying every morning, I wouldn't have guessed two shots. But there he is, two in the morning. Wow. Yeah. Also surprising that uh, Colonel Tig sleeps shirtless. This is something I dabbled in and have dabbled in on only the hottest days. I have a real hard time with this. I need something on my body. Otherwise, I I just feel uncomfortable at night. Tyke has a bit of a hair shirt. <laughs> you know what? Tyke's keeping it tight when I look at him. <laughs> he looks good. I was uh, he looked better than I do, honestly. <laughs> it seems like Tyke is keeping it tight, and it may just be because he's skipping breakfast mm. and doing those two shots. Right, yeah. and uh, that's the most important meal of the, of the day. He's having there in secret. Yeah, so uh, they are surveying this planet. They're talking about it in CIC. Cold-ass planet. It's going to be a bitch to work down there, sir. Cheer up. You know how lucky we are? We found this ugly rock. Water riots breaking out all over the fleet. Got water. Salty water. But the ice above that water is pure. And so they're like, how are we going to get this pure, delicious ice water? Uh, And what they talk about is, uh, hey, we got that that ship that's loaded with hardened criminals, we should get them to do it. I mean, Chief Tyrell and Callie look at each other and they're like, this is kind of like a Con Air Armageddon situation, right? Like, that's the pitch <laughs> in the room. Like, would you watch a movie that was the blending of those two storylines? It's a Con Air Armageddon. And they're like, yeah, obviously. Tyrell's yeah. like, I should have actually described it like that. It would have really cut to the chase here. Like what? How does Steve Buscemi fit into this in in this context? Is he like the creepy like what's he doing with the little girl in the bottom of the dried out swimming pool? Yeah, Steve Buscemi, or is he to like ask for his parking tickets to be forgiven? Steve Buscemi. I'm not going to think about the Steve Buscemi's involved in a mission like this. Instead, I think I'm just going to imagine a thousand tank topped Nick Cages with <laughs> stringy long hair. Uh-huh. Uh, asking about bunnies all the time. They're going to be the ones <laughs> down there in the cold. You know, stringy, long hair, tank top, Nick Cage, whose hands should be registered as lethal weapons, Yeah, is welcome anytime. Absolutely. In my imagination. I mean, uh, like hard working hands, but also sensitive hands, you know? You know, for all mm. the bunnies. Uh-oh. <laughs> going to get that bun at home. <laughs> It may be singed and covered in blood by the time I give it to my beloved daughter, but I've waited far too long. My accent is so unspecific. <laughs> A little Cajun, if you will, in the Bonner department, and so forth. You know how in dive bars on the edge of town, guys that hang around in the parking lot 
tend to really have it in for <laughs> men who have served in the armed forces. That's kind of a cultural trope we're all familiar with. That's the kind of trouble I got in. Oh, starting to see some blood, Ben. Mm. Starting to see some blood come out of the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Got to cut over to uh, President Roslin and Commander Adama talking over this plan. Prisoners? Don't you mean, uh, slaves? Yeah. Not really. That's Adama's pushback. He's like, hey, I'm kind of insulted by the insinuation here. This is super hard work. And, you know, you're not really a slave if what you get is an incentive for doing good slave work. I mean, regular work. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what's more is that, like, before we put these folks on the job, we can separate the murderous wheat from the docile chaff, make sure we got, like, only the best murderers, I mean prisoners, yeah, yeah. doing the water reclamation thing. The, like, alighting of the banality of evil that pervades the beginning of this episode is just astonishing like the well you know like they were convicted and sentenced to hard labor and conveniently they were also on their way back for parole hearings so like this is kind of a kind of a mulligan we can just send them and do the super hard labor that's super dangerous and many of them will die but we don't have to feel that bad about it they come so close to one of them saying they're gonna love it <laughs> they might even prefer to get out do something even if it is dangerous i mean the, also the conditions they've been in maybe worse than nightmare ice planet you know i want to push back lightly on what you said a little bit because this is a show about difficult decisions in times of existential crisis and when you're talking about the survival of the human race, just how sturdy are your principles in a moment like this? And this is what the debate is about. Like, if not slaves, then what? These are prisoners, but we want to compensate them for their, their work and their time. What's a fair way to do that? How do we keep the free people in the fleet safe? Like, mm -hmm. there's some argument here, and it's not so cut and dry like that. I guess not, but, like, also, the free people in the fleet are never brought up as, like, what if we see if anyone of them wants to volunteer? What about dispatching well, some military members from the, the Galactica? You missed the part where the camera whip pans over to Tig, and he's like, riots! <laughs> <laughs> They're rioting already! Speaking of volunteering people to go on this mission, uh, Cousin Greg throws his girlfriend's name <laughs> on the on the list of people to oversee. Hey, Cousin Greg, if you got the hots for Dwala, don't you want to keep her out of harm's way? It seems like, you know, speaking of conflict in this scene, he can't decide whether he wants to love and save this person or, like, help her out with her career ambitions. Yeah, it seemed like uh, help her out with her career ambitions with bonus of I get to see her again. Right, because it's clear that a mission like this is going to be one that Assistant Cousin Greg is going to be pretty close to throughout. Yeah. Adama kind of shoots this down in the scene. He's like, well, I mean, I'd rather have a soldier, like an infantry person on the security issue. So that's going to be the decision. Yeah. When the meeting adjourns, Roslyn requests the attention of the ship's doctor, which is something that reminded me about a great character we haven't met yet, that you haven't met yet, Ben. Dr. Cottle is mentioned in this scene, but... You're going to ruin the character for me. The character is going to be too built up, and I'm not going to like the character, and then you're going to be mad. Here's the thing. I know you're not going to like this character. That's why I keep building him up. <laughs> the problem with Doc Cottle is that it's super hard to get an appointment, and if you're out of network... Mm. Oh, yeah. Even more expensive than it would be normally. Yeah. That's another fun medical thing that happened to me recently. Was, uh, I, I had to do an ER visit for a persistent illness that wouldn't go away. And the ER part of the visit was covered, but the doctor that I randomly got assigned was out of network. That cost me $1,000. <laughs> Fucking hell. See, now I'm concerned in two ways. <laughs> I'm concerned about your health, but I'm also concerned about our show. Yeah, I'm falling apart, man. I don't want to do this without you. 
Ugh. But also, I think you need to create a succession plan for yourself. I think that's wise at this point. Yeah. I've been saying for years that Uxbridge Shimoda needs a key man policy for the two of us. But I don't think we can get one now. <laughs> no, that, that ship has sailed. I don't think an insurance company would, would work with us after what I've been through. Make it happen, Captain. As much as you emphasize your own flagging health on this show Mm -hmm. over and over again, one thing that I think this show treats as an interesting data point is that Rosalind rarely mentions her illness. Like, we're three episodes in at this point. I think it's been mentioned very quietly the both times that it was made known. Yeah. And... I like these little subtle reminders here. She's not walking around coughing into a bloody napkin. (laughs) Like she's sturdy and act as if, and she is really doing what she can to keep this secret. And she's keeping it on the download that she even wants to see a doctor. She's talking about allergies. She's not talking about cancer. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) it's not like she has diphtheria or something. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She has a regular illness that modern people get. And also assistant cousin Greg. Be a little more chill about the Lieutenant Dwala thing, okay? Just really putting horny on Maine. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the tension between Apollo and his dad is, is all the way back. Like, every fence that they mended in the pilot has been kicked down now that Apollo is working directly with the president. It's absolutely Pranikian. <laughs> in conflict in yeah. intractability yeah I didn't know we were picking sides that's why you haven't picked one yet this is something Apollo predicted right like yeah he was uh, uncomfortable by the proposition in the last episode yeah and yet acts kind of surprised when his dad has the reaction he predicted do you think this is a fault of contextualizing this in the way that it was made clear at the end of the last episode. Like President Rosalind made it clear that it was advice and not advisor. There's a distinction there. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like Commander Adama has been read in on that distinction at all. He sees it in the way that I don't think it is. Right. There is a bumper sticker that makes this distinction in the last episode that has not been slapped on his Buick. <laughs> so... Apollo goes over to this ship with all the prisoners, which, like, the prisoners are in very small cells, but the ship seems incredibly spacious. Like, maybe one thing they could do would be just to, like, make those cells spread out into more of the spaces on the ship. Ronald D. Moore uh, famously had a little bit of a rocky road on his way out of uh, the Star Trek industrial complex. Do you think it matters that the USS Conair has a what looks like a saucer section <laughs> and it is a prison ship? It does have a saucer section. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I love the Philip Seymour Hoffman vibes of the captain of this prison ship. He's great. They don't give me their files or their names. Hell, they're just numbers. He doesn't know anything. He yeah. basically, all he knows are like what the switches do. But he doesn't know who these prisoners are. He just knew he was supposed to get them from point A to point B. He knows how the radio works if you want to get on the 1MC, Apollo. He's the Captain DeSoto of the prison industrial complex. (laughs) How about Apollo's pitch here? He gets on the mic and he's like, Uh, yeah! (laughs) I got a question for the thousand prisoners down there. Do you want to volunteer to do the hardest work imaginable and potentially earn your freedom? Uh, Freedom points is what we're calling the currency here. We used to call them French points until the invasion of Iraq. I don't want to give you the wrong idea. You won't earn enough points this time to get your freedom, but you will get some points and eventually Much like a Chuck E. Cheese or a Dave & Buster's, you will accumulate enough points to get a rubber ball, or if you're very lucky, a Game Boy. Now, you all have seen movies while you've been locked up, right? And in prison films, there's always a moment where you gotta step forward if you want to volunteer to do a thing. I'm gonna open up the cell doors now. 
See if we get any step forwards for the super dangerous mission. Now I know what you're thinking. Pretty ominous to have that thing where the camera cuts around showing dozens and dozens of cell doors open. Seems like the prelude to your classic prison riot. However, there is no toilet paper in this prison, so we're pretty sure a prison riot can't happen. Get a life. Do you think prisons of the future will be bidet only? Oh, just to avoid the, the riot situation because you need toilet paper for a prison riot. You avoid the riot altogether if we're squirting water at butts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the prisoners are going to be so much happier cleaning their a-holes so thoroughly. There's one volunteer, Ben. One volunteer only. And that is Tom Zarek, who speaks for everyone. Thank you for your offer. We respectfully decline. And this guy is Richard Hatch, who played the Apollo in the 1978 version of Battlestar Galactica, yeah. Wow. Were we ever like that? I don't know. I can't remember that far back. He still has the haircut. He looks great. He really does. Look at this guy. I had to rewind this and then eventually just put on the subtitles because I was like, Tom's Eric. So this is a guy named Eric that is like owned by Tom or is he dating Tom? This just gets into the whole issue of human beings as property that's very problematic. Right. No, it's Tom Zarek, the terrorist. See, it, it, this never would have happened if Tom Zarek uh, kicked Tom's ass on his first <laughs> day in prison. Right, right. So who we really need to be talking to is Tom. Right. Because he, he kind of, he runs this <laughs> He shit. runs the show. <laughs> <laughs> what a dun-dun-dun into theme. And uh, after the theme, we got to learn a little bit more about Tom Zarek. We open up the file, and uh, Cousin Greg and Lieutenant Dwala kind of read us in on this guy. This is cute. They're having their first couple fight yeah. about politics. Is he a terrorist? Is he a freedom fighter? Por qué no las dos? <laughs> <laughs> There's something running in the background of this episode that I feel like they're super subtle about, which is this urgency to get the water. It's not like we can take our time negotiating with this guy. Like, we really need to get with the work here. Yeah, got to do it. It's, I mean, like, I feel like it is what motivates every foolish decision that is made mm -hmm. up until it goes all the way left. But yeah, this, this dude is a prisoner of conscience and or a dangerous lunatic who has a political disagreement with something that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, part of it is like cousin Greg telling Diwala or whatever, that like he really admires this guy and she has to push back and be like, you know, he doesn't speak for Sagittarians and that's what I'm from. You hit on something that, that really got my attention, which was the thing about Tom Zarek that, that goes unmentioned really is that everything that he represented all of his Miriam crimes or whatever. Mm -hmm. In addition to who's Tom and what's his deal. His cause is gone. Like, yeah. it's, it's weird. Like, the political apparatus that he rose up against, it's gone and it's never coming back and it doesn't matter. Well, let's put a pin in that because I think that that does sort of come up in the negative space of another conversation mm -hmm. that happens later mm -hmm. in an interesting way but we would be jumping way the fuck ahead right. if we start unpacking that now. Right. He's a freedom fighter. He's a butcher. Hilo is on Caprica, and Caprica is Mexico now. Feel like I'm in a movie. This is stop raining. They're at the border, clearly. <laughs> and uh, Cylon Boomer and Hilo are just walking around in plain sight, like in the middle of an abandoned city. And... Uh, Oh, God. Is that a body being eaten by rats? Ugh. Pizza rat ain't got shit on us, they say, looking at the camera. Boomer is nauseated by this, and it's, it's Hilo that uh, reassures her that, No, babe, uh, 
we're going to see that kind of a thousand times in the next 20 minutes because we're in a major city where a lot of people used to live. And those yeah. people are now meat for rats. And, you know, we will be soon, presumably. Yeah. What are they doing here? Do we know what they're what they've come to the city for? They're looking for radiation drugs, which oh. Cylon Boomer keeps hogging yeah. in a terrible way. And from above, there's a number six and a number five up there. You want any fives with that? And they are discussing the mission that Cylon Boomer's on down below. And they can't get on the same level either. Cause are humans their parents? <laughs> <laughs> or would it mean like good things for them if they all died? It seems like a position you needed to have before you nuke the entire planet of Caprica, right? Yeah. Like this shouldn't be an argument at this point. This all makes me so sad. They would have destroyed themselves anyway. They deserve what they got. They're like, should we like consider ourselves as modern Menendez brothers or something greater, you know? I mean, we are both very good looking <laughs> and also murderers. <laughs> so the comparison stands. Yeah. So uh, interesting that Cylons are disagreeing with each other. And it's interesting that the different, like we've seen a bunch of number sixes, like not all number sixes think the same way about things. Because the one in Gaius Baltar's brain has different opinions from this one, I think. Right. Yeah. There's like number six in an extremely sheer shift dress energy. And then there's this number six energy and they're two different energies. Yeah. Not all sixes. That's what I think. So Apollo's like, I got it. Just talk right to Tom's Eric. Yeah. I don't even need to go to Tom. I'll talk to his Eric. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll sort this out. You know, this guy's clearly like got the ear of the rest of the prison. Like they listen to him. He listens to Tom. But we don't need to. You know, we don't need, we just go right for the middleman, you know? So he goes down there and, you know, they have some fun, jokey banter about how amazing it is that the prison system has survived the apocalypse. Another aspect to this that I really liked was the formality that exists in this institution. Mm -hmm. Because... Tom Zarek can't really speak freely unless he's spoken to directly and in a very specific way. You've never been in a prison before, have you, Captain? No. You're fortunate. Once Apollo kind of understands the vibe, he starts to tickle Tom Zarek's ego with respect to his ideas. He's like, you know, when I was in college, I read some crazy shit, man, and your book was one of the, the craziest I ever read. <laughs> it was wild. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you were kind of my Haile Selassie. Like I started wearing, you know, Baja hoodies and rolling my hair in white guy dreads around the college dorm and calling my roommate a bald head. But I really, I really dig your stuff. <laughs> I mean, I would kind of bring up Tom's Eric in conversation at like mixers and stuff to sound informed, you know, like. A bomb throwing Jordan Peterson apologist, like edge lord in my way <laughs> through these groups <laughs> to make myself seem informed and interesting, but I'm an idiot. I know you've been in prison for a long time, but uh, you may be surprised to learn that your face in a posterized image on a red t shirt is a popular thing for a certain kind of guy in a, in a certain urban context. Whoa. Ben, what's up with that prison guard? Yeah. Does he look a little suspicious to you? He does look a little sospechoso to me. There's a little bit of a winking energy between him and Tom's Eric. You get the amount of time it takes to go, is that prison guard suspicious? To the moment that this prison guard knocks out another prison guard and opens up all the doors. Like A to B is nearly instantaneous. Yeah, the choice by Apollo to jump outside the the cage as it's slamming shut, incredibly foolish. Don't love that. I mean, in his defense, no toilet paper streaming through the air, so it doesn't have the makings of a prison riot until it does. And uh, he starts, you know, getting his ass stomped by 
angry prisoners. And his first prison riot goes about the way you would expect a guy in a uniform alone in a prison uh, to experience. Tom Zarek in this moment demonstrates a personality trait that I think makes him very scary and interesting, which is complete and total calm. Like he is watching Apollo get stomped out as dispassionately as anyone could, like just chilling the most almost. And that's really what makes my skin crawl, you know, like that's that's really evil right there. Speaking of people who are getting nut stomped by very calm people, uh, Dr. Baltar tries to kick it to Starbuck and uh, gets sand kicked in his face, basically. Lieutenant Thrice, good to see you. Oh, good to see you too. Really? No. (laughs) Did this kid uh, win a contest or something? The mushroom haircutted kid who's who's walking along with Starbuck doing this drive-by nut kicking? Talking about Boxy? Oh, fuck, that's Boxy? Yeah, that's Boxy. (laughs) Did they change the actor? I think that's the same actor. It's definitely the same haircut. Wow, okay, that makes sense. You know what, though? It's a kid actor, and they shot this a year later, so he grew up a little bit in between. Alex Boxman. Yeah. Who is living a life, like, with recently deceased parents, Without a care in the world. I half expected him to be smoking the cigar Mm -hmm. in that pilot meeting that Starbuck leads in the scene after this. Like (laughs) an amazing moment because she's doing like jack off jokes Mm -hmm. about one of one of her pilots right in front of this kid. Yeah. Tig doesn't like it, doesn't like her leadership style, doesn't feel like this was an appropriate meeting to bring a child to. Where's your mommy? Dead. Where's yours? Doesn't like the bits. Yeah, no, no bits on flat tops. Just lights her up. But Starbuck has the cheat code here in a conflict like this, because when you smell booze on Tig, that keeps a superior officer away from your shit. Yeah. He is looking for Boomer. Boomer's in the tool room, parenthetically getting fucked, because that's where Boomer <laughs> goes to do that. Yeah. And we cut back to, I think I guess this is the bridge of the prison ship. There's a lot of cross-cutting starting here between the USS Conair and Commander Adama's quarters. Yeah. So Tom's Eric wants to talk to Apollo about the commander and not to the commander. Like he's like, there's not going to be the traditional negotiation situation here. And this is kind of a surprising experience. For uh, Apollo, who who was expecting this to be a pretty like standard issue, we have taken hostages. Now we're going to ask for pizza and a bag of money and a helicopter. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, that would be simpler. Like what Tom Zarek wants is our our ideas, and what Apollo seems more able to provide are like resources. Yeah, and Apollo's like, is Tom a real guy? Or is that like, is that something you made up to like add to your mystique? I still can't get over this name. <laughs> I mean, you must have to repeat it on the phone all the time. I am Tom Zarek. The commander is sort of uh, entertaining Dr. Baltar in his office. They're doing some like fancy rich guy tire kicking stuff like, oh, like you got a great big painting by a certain guy. (laughs) That's something. I like that guy. Also. You really do have an excellent eye for art. I like the detail of Adama drinking water like scotch, like really savoring it. I thought that was cool. <laughs> but completely uncool is the verbal diarrhea that Gaius Baltar has in this scene, just projecting it all over the painting, all over the floor, all over Adama himself. Yeah. And Adama here is so cool and so quiet and so efficient with his words. He's like conversational emodium, getting... Gaius Baltar, 
to cut to the chase. And in this scene, number six appears in Gaius's imagination and tries to like scare him into staying the course because Gaius Baltar tells Adama, I can't build the Cylon detector. Can't do it for, for Miriam reasons before finally getting, I w- I'll say provoked into asking for a nuclear weapon from Adama in order to complete the Cylon detector project. Right, because Six is in the conversation yeah, and in his imagination and really fucking flies off the handle at Baltar when he kind of admits that he doesn't have the goods that he promised them. Like he's not, he's not working on it really. Uh, he's not giving straight answers until he is, which is, I, I bit off more than I could chew with this and I'm embarrassed about it. And six kind of goes to 11. Mm. They're going to tear your head off and throw your body out of the <laughs> Well, it's one louder, isn't it? You never see her like this. We've never seen her like this on the show so far. It's shocking. You think she wants the nuke? I mean, obviously. Who wouldn't, right? Yeah. So back on the USS Conair, Apollo and Tom Zarek are talking over the working relationship between his father and President Roslin and the fact that they have different views on things. And this is clearly going to be something that Tom Zarek can wedge as a strategy. And we cut back over to Adama's quarters. Gaius will finally have his warhead at the end of this explanation, a totally crazy explanation and a totally plausible defense. Adama's like, we only have five of these. You want me to give you one of them? That's like one fifth of our warheads. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it seems like a lot. But Baltar's going to get his thing and uh, to kind of put a period on the end of the sentence, I like Adama pouring the rest of his water back in the jug. Yeah. Yeah, save that one for later. Speaking of liquids spraying about <laughs> into all sorts of containers. And also uh, diminishing numbers of bombs. <laughs> We're in the storage locker with Chief Tyrell and Boomer, and uh, he continues to be dick drunk, and she continues to believe the worst of her situation, and nothing softens a boner quicker than Commander Tig walking in. I need to speak with the lieutenant, Malone. He's there to tell Boomer to knock that shit off. There will not be fraternization among the crew people, Yeah. especially you two. No more using the tool room as your personal fuck palace. It stops now. Was that what he was looking for her for? I think like so. Like when he went into the like flight briefing, which I guess, yeah, I guess she should have been in, right? Because she's a Raptor pilot, but not a Viper pilot. Yeah. And also put down some kitty litter <laughs> in the storage locker. The floor is so slick. <laughs> you, want, you want people to slip and fall? With the number of humans we have left? It is clear in this next scene that every ship has the ability to communicate with the entire fleet whenever it wants. Because on the Audrey 2 bridge, they're listening to a message from Tom Zarek that's going fleet wide. And in it, he's making clear his demands. Finally. He wants President Rosalind to resign. And he wants a free and open election to install a new government. Because after all, who the hell is this President Roslin? She ascended to uh, the presidency through death. This, this wasn't a president that was elected into office. So let's start this whole new era. Right. And he doesn't get very much further into this message before they can jam that communication. And this instigates a phone call between Adama and Roslin, and they have a very different take. On the situation, it seems like Adama is like, just ignore this guy. He's a fucking prisoner. Who gives a shit? And Rosalind's like, no, I mean, when you're talking about me and my career, like nothing he said was untrue, you know? (laughs) (laughs) And the thing about this guy is that like when you're a prisoner and especially a political prisoner, it gives you a great amount of power, especially if you become a martyr. So like... I'm actually very threatened by this guy. Right. And Adama finally, 
I won't say acquiesces, but he's like, you know, we should really like talk to this guy, right? It's not a negotiation, but like, what else are we going to do? Remember the water that we needed so desperately? We might as well just talk to the dude. Yeah, there's that hesitation of does talking to him legitimize him? Does does negotiation, you know, encourage more of this type of shit from other people? Yeah. Meanwhile, Starbuck is in the background with Tig, just like planning out the the raid that they're gonna do. I love this, like the efficiency of movies and TV, where like suddenly, you know, <laughs> we haven't gotten to it yet, but there's there's an episode of Baywatch where it's revealed that Mitch was also in the Navy SEALs with Court, <laughs> which is like amazing. Uh, what? Yeah, like it, but you know. <laughs> I guess just because this week we needed the script to like, you know, justify Mitch being able to do some crazy thing. Uh, uh, yeah, he's just also. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Navy Seal. Uh, Starbuck is just also a sniper, and Tiger's like, you know, I fucking hate her, but I have to agree with her on that one. She's right, for once. Kind of amazing. It feels like initially they're going behind Commander Adama's back here. This is like Worf proposing a rescue mission to Riker and going like, can I do it, dad? (laughs) (laughs) Like if mom says no, ask dad or whatever. Like it's weird. Adama rolls up and I thought they were going to be in trouble for even having a conversation of this nature. But Adama's like, no, this is good. Assassination is on the table as long as none of the hostages get hurt. Yeah. So uh, we cut over to some of those self-same hostages Cousin Greg and Duala still not having a great day together. W slash R slash T, him getting her stuck on this mission. And now she is in jail with him. But they're having a much better day than Callie, who yeah. has attracted the attention from some random prisoner. And what I like about Callie is she seems pretty experienced at rejecting jerk offs like this guy. The problem is. He doesn't take that rejection well at all. Don't mock me, little girl. We cut back up where Tom's Eric is talking to Apollo about, you know, the like rules of succession, making this illegitimate lady the president. And they kind of get in this crazy like villain conversing with his hostage conversation about the nature of Apollo and what like what symbolic meaning we can find in the name Apollo uh, when the phone rings and uh, it's it's Zeus on the line, Zeus calling Zarek, and Adama is kind of like trying to chat him up, but he's not fooling Tom Zarek, and it's clear to Apollo that this was the plan the entire time. And the election that Tom Zarek wants so badly isn't something that Adama is willing or able to grant, right? Like, that makes the phone call pretty short. Tom right. Zarek's like, I'm cutting to the chase. This is what I want. And Adama's like, well, I mean, I'm in the military. What do you expect me to do? <laughs> but, like, while this conversation's happening, those raptors attached to the hull, and you know that this this rescue mission is about to pop off soon. Yeah. But not before uh, something else is in danger of popping off. That creepy prisoner is now inside Callie's cell, and he takes Callie away. And Cousin Greg and uh, Duala do not like what this suggests. Yeah. So we're cutting around very rapidly now to, like, the Marines that are creeping around on the ship and Callie in, in this cell. The guy that's attacking her is seemingly doing this with Tom Zarek's blessing, did you think that? I didn't think that. I mean, Tom Zarek is not doing anything to intervene. He doesn't seem to like... He doesn't do anything to intervene at any point with anyone. Yeah. I mean, like, Apollo doesn't even ask him, like, what do you think Tom would think of this? Uh. But, you know, there's like this crowd around the cell and Callie has been shot. And Starbuck is like up in position, up in the up in the rafters of the uh, USS Con Air. And um, Apollo, like, disarms one of the rioting prisoners and shoots the attacker. And now he's got the gun trained on Tom Zarek. And guess what? He says Tom Zarek was right all along about the consent of the governed. They do need to have elections. 
The offer on the table is get that water, then you get your elections. And it's in this moment, Tom Zarek has to decide whether or not he wants to be a martyr more than he wants democracy. This is live free or die, actually. Yeah. So you talked earlier about like what Tom Zarek is protesting against doesn't exist anymore. And I think that like one of the things that makes him break in this moment is this, like, it sort of seems like this current protest is like a, I'm just a guy that does this. Like I'm a beaver. I'm going to build a dam no matter where you put me. And, and like, I have found myself in a completely new, like geopolitical situation. And so this is my new cause uh, just because, like, I'm guy that pursues a cause violently guy. Boy, wouldn't terror beavers be such a great high school mascot? <laughs> I thought you were going to say high school musical, in which case, fuck yes. <laughs> they can be both things. Yeah, porque no los dos. So when Zarek, like, backs down and agrees, I kind of don't believe it. Well, for that reason, and also, like, when Starbucks bullet misses when Apollo pulls him out of the way from the kill shot there's a look on his face like what do you make of that expression he you could argue I think that he's upset by nearly being killed but also he could be disappointed at not being killed right yeah I feel like the episode is trying to make a case for disappointed but I think that it kind of undercut itself with him being like cool like handshake on it you know you know there is a science fiction series that that made the feelings of a primary character really clear in this way hmm. disappointed <laughs> <laughs> so after this incident we're aboard Colonial One, and there's a McLaughlin group with Adama and Roslyn. Issue one. And they are not happy with the outcome of this mission. I don't believe this. It's unacceptable. It's done. Yeah. This was a very interesting dynamic because it really felt like Apollo was like parenting upward. Like yeah. mommy and daddy don't agree with what he did at school today. Yeah. And he's like, as a matter of fact, this is what the Constitution says. So. Right. You should be happy. Here's the situation on the USS Conair. The prisoners run that ship now. That, like, they've dismissed it, its official crew. The prisoners run it. They're disarmed, though, so that's good. And they're dependent, and that's also important. They're dependent on the Battlestar for stuff like food and water. They're committed to doing this water mission, so that's a good thing. And, uh, by the way, President Roslin, you have seven months left in your presidential term. And so all Apollo did was just enforce the the rule of law as everyone has agreed to already. Like their 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 government's constitution says that once the term is up, they're gonna hold an election anyway. So Apollo didn't do anything wrong, man. <laughs> Apollo did everything right. Sure did. Here's the problem though, Ben. Can President Rosalind get more than the 1,000 votes that exist on the USS Con Air that are definitely going to Tom Zarek? <laughs> right? Because you're, you're starting, you got to feel like you're starting from behind a little bit if you're President Rosalind. Who is President Rosalind's constituency? Well, we'll find out a little bit later, but first we've got to ramp things up with Tig and Starbuck who don't agree on much, but they do agree on booze. And Starbuck has showed up with a flask. Tig is pretty excited until he realizes the fast one that has been pulled on him. What the hell is this? Water? <clears throat> That's your ass. It feels like this scene represents a burying of the hatchet a little bit, or this is just two professionals concluding what is ostensibly a successful mission and getting past their bullshit temporarily, right? Right. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, I loved the the construction of like your flaws are professional, mine are just personal. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty fun. They're going to stay at loggerheads, but um, man, I just can't imagine being professionally flawless. It sounds great. Yeah, we'll never know what that's like, Ben. Yeah. 
I've got personal flaws and professional flaws. Yeah. Mostly. You got flaws all the way down, brother. On her way to being less flawed is Callie in the six bay who has had her, her stomach wound from a firearm stitched up. It seems like she's going to be okay. Uh, visiting hours are open for uh, Chief Tyrell and the rest of her co-workers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me ask you something. The balloon industrial complex only exists because of uh, sick and injured people in hospitals, right? Like, <laughs> you sell the most <laughs> balloons in those situations, right? Yeah, or to like kids uh, throwing water balloons at each other at a park, I suppose. I guess the scarcity of balloons is apparent in this scene. None of the coworkers bring one of those. Pff, fucking rude. Yeah, I mean, how beloved is Callie really? <laughs> Hard to say. Finally, in our final scene, President Rosalind gets a goodbye visit from Apollo. He's going to go back to the Battlestar. But first, he wants to tell her, that his intention wasn't to be disloyal. What his loyalty is toward is to the laws and constitutional articles of their people. And when he thinks this conversation is over, she invites him to sit. And in this moment, she opens her robe, metaphorically. Metaphor! Because it's this scene where she admits her terminal cancer diagnosis. And she really wants him to keep that a secret because a president with cancer could affect the hope of the fleet. And Apollo says that she can count on him to keep that a secret. Did you like this episode, Adam? So say we all. So say we all. Just in that final scene, it made me think of how many different conflicts exist in one single episode. You know, this idea of like the secrets that so many characters are keeping from each other. And all of them basically are the danger to themselves that they present that is up to and greater than the Cylon threat in many ways. Like, what's going to get them? It seems to make it pretty clear that uh, being destroyed from within is a possibility, either by lack of water or from dangerous prisoners operating a starship in their fleet which Adama makes clear could be a weapon in and of itself. Right. I mean, all this episode did, all it did was multiply the dangers across the board. (laughs) And I think in a really interesting way. I mean, it's not just danger from one direction. I think that's part of the brilliance of this show. It's coming from every direction and it's stressful. So yeah, I like the episode. What about you? I was a little disappointed in it because I think that the idea of Tom's Eric being a terror beaver and like all circumstances have changed, but, but he has not. And therefore he has like a new political cause that he is willing to put everyone's lives at risk to advance was like so interesting. And I just felt like it kind of like missed on like taking that all the way home. But, I mean, this is the beginning of a relationship with a new character with the potential for that going forward, no? I guess so, yeah. I mean, he definitely does not feel like Monster of the Week in that Mm -hmm. way, and therefore more can be done with him. But I think that they could have resolved that a little bit more, and that moment where he like is like, okay, deal, at the end, just doesn't feel... Like, if that is what they're trying to present him as being... That's really interesting, but that's not the behavior of that guy. Do you think that he's smarter than Apollo or Adama or Roslyn? No, I don't think so. I think uh, willing to be more brutal to like get what he wants than any of them. I didn't mean smarter in a way that you know, like invited a moral equivalent. I just mean like, is he thinking steps and steps ahead in the way that? Maybe other characters are not, do you think? No, I don't think so. I think that that's sort of the the idea of him as, as quote unquote terrorist is that like his political goals are almost like beside the point. It's about him get, getting what he wants and what everybody else wants be damned. Mm-hmm. You know, like most like violent political change is kind of minoritarian in nature. And we have no idea like what, 
the like antecedents of his being in prison were we don't know like whether he was like a super righteous guy like i mean it's it seems like a lot of uh you know ivory tower types were at least willing to entertain what he was saying as valid but like absent any of that context it's really hard to say so i don't know i I think that i i was just like a little frustrated by the wanting more more of those questions answered in an interesting way than than we got here. But you might you you might be right. Maybe they're giving us the first chapter in in a novel about a character like that. Yeah, I think that's where we're on our way toward. All right. Well, do you want to see if we're on our way toward some priority one messages, Adam? Oh yeah, I'm gonna FTL jump on over there. Priority one message from Starfleet coming in on secured channel. Ben, no priority one messages today. I know that could be a temporary state for the feed once people listen to how exciting Hot Silence Over is. Sure. If for some reason this episode makes it to the feed without priority one messages, you should know that uh, a message of this kind is a great way to support the production of the show. And you can write one to us by going to MaximumFun.org slash Jumbotron. Get right into this feed and uh, make it happen. Get your message out to the people about uh, the free and fair election that you want to have happen. (laughs) Goes a long way towards the production of our show, and we appreciate it. Sure do. Hey, Ben. What's that, Adam? Did you discover yourself an Edward Larkin? Larkin. I think I'm going to give it to Secretary Cousin Greg for having an idea about how he would... uh, help his girlfriend and help himself get his dick wet and have it go as far left as this. Like Lord knows I've had ideas about those things that have gone left in my life, but never so far left that she and I were both stuck in a jail cell together. (laughs) We're not even together, right? They're, they're separated. They can't even conjugate. It feels very grounded in reality that no matter how bad or stressful the moment like folks are still gonna find a way to fuck around and think about fucking and they're gonna make all kinds of mistakes because of it we're only human right yeah they're just innocent men and women (laughs) (laughs) they're they're just normal men uh for me it's gonna be colonel tig i'm looking at that bottle and i'm noting the rate of two shots per morning I think you got to start to taper that off a little bit, right? Are you taking a two shots in the morning habit all the way to cold turkey? I don't know, Colonel Tig. Seems like you're running out. How's that going to work out for you? (laughs) What they need is to get a still operational on this ship and uh, and soon. But you're going to need a lot of water for that. So, hey, you know who has improvised liquor technology? A thousand prisoners. Aboard the USS Con Air. Those are his best friends in the world right now. Yeah. He doesn't even know it. I'm going to predict a special relationship going forward. Yeah. Like Britain and the United States. Precisely. (laughs) What do we have going forward in the next episode of Hot Cylon Summer, Ben? Adam, our next episode is season one, episode four. Act of Contrition. A Crisis. Forces Commander Adama, Lee Adama, and Kara Thrace to finally face a ghost from their past. The late Zach Adama. Whoa. I'm always just momentarily confused when I hear Kara Thrace instead of Starbuck. I just like using call signs. Kara Thrace is not a character we've met yet. (laughs) Neither is Zach Adama. Interesting. Yeah. Zach Adama shows up with... uh, with bleached tips and a giant cell phone. All right. Well, uh, this has been a ton of fun, Adam, but uh, why don't you hit the listeners of Greatest Trek Presents Hot Cylon Summer with a warning buoy? Prepare a buoy and launch it when ready. Warning buoys. An emergency buoy. A warning buoy. Of course, this is our segment where we shout out somebody that shouted us out, show our appreciation for a friend of DeSoto who went out of their way to recommend our show. 
either by reviewing us on a podcast app or uh, shouting us out on social media. Really helps get us up there in the old algo. The algo rules everything around us, Ben. The algo forced you to record an episode today. I like that kind of like iron taste in my mouth that the algo gives me. Oh uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, when I skip flossing for a while and then start flossing again, I'll get that taste. Well, Adam, uh, today's warning point is from uh, Carter Kalchik on TikTok. And, uh, you know, I'll, at the end of our uh, coverage of Discovery, we had our, our series wrap up episode and um one of the great greatest things that maybe ever been edited of us was wendy making a super cut of all the different ways you and i referred to admiral the mater d who simply cannot be bribed hmm. and carter made a tiktok video about uh, his love for that bit and threw to just a a, a small sample of that because i think that the super cut went on for minutes and minutes but by editing in different images of the admiral uh, against <laughs> different ways we referred to him really made it come to life in a whole new way for me. So uh, it was a really funny video and we really appreciate Carter because he's got a great big TikTok platform where he talks about, you know, spicy romance novels featuring boys who like to sleep with boys. Well, anything that helps spread the word on TikTok helps us a great deal. So thanks, yeah. Carter, for that. Carter's helping spread the word and spread the cheeks, and we appreciate him. And we appreciate anyone who gives us a social media shout. If you'd like to hear your words coming out of our mouths, you know what to do. Post about us on socials or uh, leave a nice review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcatcher you use. Yeah, and we'll launch that warning bois out far and wide. Ben, I'm so glad we could record today. Uh, I hope you're feeling better. Hope you continue to feel better as we go. I know the FODs are out there pulling for you. Thanks, dude. The sooner you can get back to 100%, the sooner I can get back to uh, hearing big laughs on this show, which yeah. is really the whole reason I do this. <laughs> it's been a long week. I'm uh, very glad we could uh, we could get one recording done. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did not expect... It to be the way that it was and uh, much appreciation to you and Wendy and Rob and everybody over here at Expert Shimoda for bearing with me in my convalescence but uh, for now, take it away Wendy Greatest Trek is an Oxbridge Shimoda podcast on the Maximum Fun Network it's hosted by Ben Harrison and Adam Pranica and it's produced and edited by Wendy Pretty Next week on Hot Cylon Summer, it's Battlestar Galactica Season 1, Episode 4, Act of Contrition. Special thank you to the members who support this podcast on a monthly basis. You can set up a membership and get instant access to all the great bonus content at MaximumFun.org slash join. You can also support for free by subscribing to the At Greatest Trek YouTube channel or by leaving a five-star rating and review on your podcatcher. We appreciate that. Thanks to Nick Dittmore, who created the show art, and to Adam Ragusea, who composed the theme music for the show. Thanks to Bill Tilly and Rob Adler for running all of the At Greatest Trek social media pages that you can find and follow wherever you hang out online. And be sure to use the hashtag Greatest Trek when you post about the show. You can also join FOD-run communities on Facebook, Reddit, and on Discord at DrunkShimoda.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week on Greatest Trek. Oh, you just got blood coming out of your mouth. That's all. Yeah. Maximum Fun. A worker-owned network of artist-owned shows. Supported. Directly. By you.